The farmland was poor, but the family was safely above the bitter New England poverty level of the poorest New England farmers. There was some money from the sale of ship timber, but frugality was necessary, and everyone had to work. The winters were like iron. Underclothing was almost unknown. The houses were poorly warmed, and the churches not at all. And the food in farmers' homes lacked variety and was ill-cooked. Whittier suffered more than most boys from the cold. His boyhood was before the time of woolen underwear, and he once said, quote, the only difference between summer and winter clothing was a muffler or mittens on the coldest day. His home, with its treasured associations of emotional warmth, family love, psychological comfort, complete trust and personal security, was a solid foundation for Whittier's life. And while, with care, our mother laid the work aside, her steps she stayed one moment, seeking to express her grateful sense of happiness for food and shelter, warmth and health, and love's contentment more than wealth. With simple wishes, not the weak, vain prayers which no fulfillment seek, but such as warm the generous heart, or prompt to do with heaven its part, that none might lack that bitter night for bread and clothing, warmth and light. Whittier was self-taught. His mother was a great inspiration to him and read to him. Roland Woodwell wrote in his biography about Whittier, quote, Whittier read all the books in the house. There were 18 biographies. From their number, it may be assumed that they were brief and inexpensive. There were four travel books and four religious books, besides ones mentioned. Whittier attended a school near his home only three months a year. Whittier's first schoolmaster, Joshua Coffin, loaned him a copy of Burns, which proved to be Whittier's Passport to the World. Quote, I saw through all familiar things the romance underlying, the joys and griefs that plume the wings of fancy skyward flying. Joshua Coffin often read to him. He roomed with the Whittiers and later a familiar figure of many years in the town of Newbury, where he was the town clerk and historian. By the time John Greenleaf Whittier was 16, he was composing with extraordinary fluency and with considerable skill. At 18, he had written verses which his sister Mary thought good enough to be published, and secretly sent them to W. L. Garrison, editor of the Free Press. Garrison urges Whittier's father to give him more schooling. Whittier's father replied, Sir, poetry will not give him bread. 
Whittier got a term at Haverhill Academy, paying his way by making shoes. He continued to write poems in astonishing profusion, taught school himself for a term in his native township, then took a final term at the academy. Whittier had repeated disappointments in love. Perhaps the greatest was Mary Emerson, a cousin who was not a Quaker. He was very popular with women throughout his whole life, but his rejected love by Miss Emerson seemed to be the end of his search for a wife. Whittier was unusual among Quakers in being a bachelor. He didn't want to marry because of his extensive travel, bad health, and poor economy. Also, his faith dictated that he had to marry a Quaker woman. Whittier decided to earn his living by journalism, and at the end of his 21st year, in 1828, he became the editor of The American Manufacturer in Boston. The choice was significant. For three years, Whittier had been heralded as an unlettered poet, a sort of local phenomenon, who was possibly destined, as Garrison had prophesied, to rank, quote, among the bards of his country. Now Whittier was turning his shrewd facility to politics and other interests. Whittier had many of the qualities and experiences necessary for being a good politician. Skillful writer and editorial engagements in Haverhill, Hartford, and Philadelphia widened his acquaintance and increased his self-confidence. His judgment was clever and careful. Whittier's knowledge of local conditions was very astute. It was broadened first from his native town and county, and then to New England and other eastern states. He seemed to perceive how people were thinking and acting. People were never abstractions to him. They were real with ambitions to be tempted generosities to be wakened, and weakness to be utilized. He was tireless in personal persuasion, secret correspondence, and in fighting fire with fire. He was willing to compromise on non-essentials for the sake of bringing things to pass. Underneath all questions of policy lay his inherited democratic sympathy with the ordinary man. By 1833, Whittier was deep in a spiritual crisis. He recognized that he loved power and had used it as a politician. His writing was being noticed, but he saw no future in writing poems. Whittier doesn't easily fit categories. By the standards of Quakers in the 1830s and 1840s, he was rather worldly. He didn't always use the plain language of thee and thy to non-Quakers. His clothes weren't always plain. He freely associated with non-Quakers. 